All right, welcome to our final project video tutorial. We're looking at Project Unit 5, the fourth part of the project dealing with hypothesis testing. You may recall in Project Unit 4, Part 3, um, we created some uh, confidence intervals, and you can see those here. Um, we're going to be doing some hypothesis testing, or well, a hypothesis test, and we don't really need the confidence interval stuff, but we do need those sample statistics. So what I recommend doing is to make a copy of that uh, sheet, and uh, and then let's call that one we made before uh, confidence intervals, and then let's make the new one uh, hypothesis testing, and then we can just get rid of all this stuff on confidence intervals that we don't need. Uh, another thing I realized is that we were using the standard deviation of the sampling distribution quite a bit. And uh, so I think it's nice to maybe shortcut and have that ready to go. And remember, that's just the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. But it'll make our formulas a little cleaner to have that separate. All right. Uh, one of the tougher parts of this people have trouble with is coming up with this claim. Um, but your claim should really be a complete sentence that talks about the value of the population parameter. And almost everybody, I think, is looking at the mean. So you're looking at the population mean. But you don't want to just say population mean. You want to be as specific as you can. And so remember, for my example, I am looking at the uh, mean systolic blood pressure of adult Americans. Uh, and then you want to say something about the value. Is it equal to a number? Is it less than or equal to a number? Is it greater than a number? That kind of thing. So there's sort of six inequalities uh, where one is the actual equation. Um, you can do where you compare the mean that you have with some other value. And this number you pick is really just a number you pick. It's a lot like the one we picked before. In fact, you can use the same number if that worked out well. But the goal is that we want a p-value that's not so big that it's 1 or even really um, close to 1. And then we don't want it so small that it ends up being basically being 0. Um, and so that can be careful. I mean, one thing you can do is kind of dance around the outside of the confidence intervals you created. If you go back and look at those and look at your upper and lower bounds and you pick something kind of around there because that's really like the borderline case, right? Um, so feel free to do something like that and we'll talk about how you might have to adjust it if it's not good. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pick the number 119.5 um, and I guess before I say that I got to say uh, something uh, is, I'm going to say is greater than uh, and by doing this, I am taking the greater than option away from you. So you need to do one of the other options. Is equal to, is not equal to, uh, is less than or equal to, something like that for your claim. Um, and again, the number, you shouldn't pick 119.5 either because you should be picking a number based on your data set and your sample mean and that kind of thing. So uh, remember, you, the number you cannot use is you can't use the sample mean itself. But your number may be very close, right? Mine is pretty close to the sample mean. All right, so I've got that. Once you have that claim as a sentence, you want to go ahead and write this out as a pair of hypotheses. And you should be able to turn the claim into an inequality statement um, using the correct symbol. Uh, if you go to Insert and then Symbols, um, you can find the uh, Greek letter mu. It's uh, under uh, Greek, I think. I think these all kind of have some funny symbols. OK. Uh, That's just the font. Uh, 
Okay, sorry about that. I found out. So if you look at the subset under Greek and Coptic, you should be able to find that symbol. Here it is, the small Greek letter mu. And once you have found that, which I did a while ago, it'll appear in your recently used symbols, and you won't have to go through all that to find it again. Uh, so anyway, uh, mu, and uh, and then greater than, and then 119.5. And this is a alternative hypothesis um, because it does not have the equality in it. Uh, if it's an equal to or a greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, it's going to be your null. Otherwise, it's your alternative. Um, but you can get the null from this. It should just be the similar statement, but with the opposite symbol. So instead of greater than, it should be less than or equal to. Again, those can be found here, um, probably under uh, mathematical operators. Yeah, so in mathematical operators, you have less than or greater than, and there's your not equal to in case you pick the equal not equal pair. So less than or equal goes in there. And there I have my null and alternative hypotheses, where the alternative is the claim. And again, your claim could be the null. It could be the alternative. All right. Uh, so next we are going to write the type of test and distribution that should be used. So the type of test is, in this case, a right tail test. By now you should know how that's determined from the hypotheses. That is not going to necessarily be the case for your problem. You could be right, left, or two-tailed. Um, the distribution used should be the same for everybody, um, unless I've talked to you about a special type of data set. Um, some of you, I guess I have seen one or two of those uh, where you're using the normal distribution, but uh, most people will be using the T distribution. Uh, then we want to calculate the p-value, and we can actually do that once we have the uh, test statistic, which is basically just a z-score for our number here. So we would take the 119.5, which is in our hypothesis statement, and we would subtract the sample mean, and we would divide by the sampling distribution's standard deviation. So that's your normal z-score formula for the sampling distribution. And it tells you how many standard deviations you are away from the mean in the sampling distribution. Now you're able to get your p-value from that. And with the p-value, you want to be using t-dist if you're using the t-distribution, or norm-dist if you're using the norm distribution. We would put in that test statistic. Remember, if your test statistic is negative, you would need to flip the sign on it. Uh, degrees of freedom is your sample size minus one, of course. And then tails is one for me because I have a right tailed test, but if you had a two tailed test, you would need a two there. So putting all that together, we get our p value, which is 0 0.024. All right, so uh, now I want to get a graph of the sampling distribution. And uh, you can use the normal distribution site or the t-distribution site, uh, either one. I think the normal one makes it a little better of a graph um, because it allows you to adjust to the values you have. So you do want to get area from a value because the area is the probability, which is the p-value. So you want this to calculate your p-value and confirm it. Um, and I would set the mean to be the proposed hypothesized mean of 119.5. Uh, standard deviation should be the sampling distributions standard deviation. So that for me is 0 0.23073576. I guess it cuts you off right there. So that 5 gets rounded to a 6. And then the above below thing is your left right. We're doing a right tail test and uh, we would use the sample mean. Um, so right tail would go above or to the right and the sample mean is 119.0438. All right, and then recalculating. Oh, I guess we need to go below. So uh, we can see that this 
does not match up with our p-value. And so when that's the case, that means usually you just need to adjust And there we go. That actually matches up with it. That 0.024 is our p-value. So there's a picture of what's going on where, you know, the, the p-value assumes that the population mean is the 119.5, and so that's the center of your sampling distribution, right? The mean of the sampling distribution is the same as the mean of the population. And uh, so this is very similar to the mean or the distribution for the population, but uh, we're using the sampling distribution instead. So we've adjusted that standard deviation and uh, we have the same mean. And then this is us drawing this sample, right? We found this one sample I did of, of 6,668 and it's got a sample mean of 119.04, that's it right there. And so what are the chances of getting a sample mean like that or less than that? There's your chances right there. So you want to go ahead and grab this. You can uh, use something like the snipping tool to go ahead and cut out this right here and then paste that right on your spreadsheet. So you can make it even smaller if you want. All right, but you're including that in your report. And that brings us to the next part, which is to explain the meaning of the p-value in complete sentences. So it says refer to the definition of p-value which is up in the vocabulary and it basically says that you assume the null hypothesis is true and you get a sample like the one you got, what is the probability of that happening? So we want to put that in here. Um, so I guess we need to put this graph lower. Let's see. So, meaning of p-value, uh, assuming the null is true, and we don't want to write the null is true, Let's, what does it actually mean? Assuming the, the mean systolic blood pressure is less than or equal, I mean really it's probably good just to say equal to here, equal to 119 0.5, right? That's the assumption is that the null is true. The p-value is the probability of getting a sample with mean and then we need to go up a little to see what that is. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, 119.04371912. And you can also put in this other stuff if you want. Because really, it is technically meaning a sample of size 6,668 and a mean of 119.04371912. So basically, you know, that's the specific sample we got. And, you know, is that. Is that going to be unlikely or likely? The p-value tells you how likely that is. And why is this meaningful? Well, if the p-value is really small, um, then it's unlikely that we were able to get this. But we know we got this. We know we got this sample. So if you're very confident in your sample, which we are, then that means that that whole assumption must be false. And so that's what you're ultimately trying to do is you're, you're counting on the sample data to be accurate and you're testing whether or not that assumption is false or not. So, um, you know, we really need a, a level of significance to do this test. And uh, I guess I will put that in uh, right here. It's not in the directions of this video, but I will change that for you. Uh, because, you know, is 0 0.025, it's 0 0.024%, is that, is that too small or is it not? You have to decide where the cutoff is. Um, you know, that, that kind of goes along with a 95% confidence interval. So you're going to pick what level of significance you want. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and go with 0, .0 uh, 
um, to five. Right, which level of significance of 0 0.025 on a one-tailed test, that does go along with um, a 95% confidence level. And so then we'd be comparing it to that number. Right? So the last part is to state the decision and conclusion. And the decision is just a comparison between the p-value and the level of significance. And if the p-value is less than level of significance, which it is, um, we would reject the null hypothesis. Because we're basically saying, yeah, this is, this is too unlikely. I, the lowest I will go is a 2.5% chance. You're saying it's less than 2.5% chance? That's not likely. That means that this uh, assumption of the null must be false. I'm going to reject it. So uh, when your p-value is less than level of significance, we reject the null. And then we write our conclusion in terms of the claim. So the null is not the claim. Um, what does this tell us about the claim? Well, if you've rejected the null, then you are supporting the alternative. And if you are supporting an alternative in this problem, you are supporting the claim. So we have enough evidence at the... We have enough evidence to support the claim that the mean systolic blood pressure is greater than 119.5. And you know, that was really close. So that was just, just in there. Um, and, you know, this isn't an obvious thing, right? The mean being greater than 119.5 because what was the mean that I got? It wasn't greater, right? It was it was less than that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're still willing to go along with this and we are 95% confident, you could say, um, to support this claim. Um, and you, so some people will put the level of significance or the confidence level in their conclusion, but uh, I'm just going to say that we do support the claim right there. All right, and that actually wraps up the hypothesis testing process. Uh, so a few notes, if you got to this p-value part and you were getting something um, less than, you know, uh, with, with too many zeros, so getting it too small, um, to the point where it can't actually come up on this as anything other than zero, then that's too extreme. And again, if it comes up as just all nine, same idea. So you need to pick something close to, um, closer to between zero and one. So too close to zero, too close to one, no good. Go back and pick a different number here for your claim. Because you do want something between zero and 100%. All right, uh, hopefully that's helpful and you can follow along. And I look forward to seeing your assignments. And this wraps up our four-part project using Excel to analyze a data set.